and uh, Lawrence will welcome our uh, presenter today. But to start, you know, I would like to read uh, our nonpartisan statement and our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. The league is proud to be a nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates, political parties at any level of government, but always working on vital issues of concern to, <clears throat> to members and to the public. And I think we'll find that our presenter it, will be covering one of the vital issues of concern. Now for the commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. League of Women Voters is an organization fully committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion in principle and in practice. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are central to the organization's current and future success, engaging all individuals, households, communities, and policymakers in creating a more perfect democracy. There shall be no barriers to full participation in this organization on the basis of gender, gender identity, ethnicity, race, native or indigenous origin, age, generation, sexual orientation, culture, religion, belief systems, marital status, parental status, socioeconomic status, language, accent, ability status, mental health, educational level or background, geography, nationality, work style, work experience, job role function, thinking style, personality type, physical appearance, political perspective or affiliation, and or any other characteristics that can be identified as recognizing or illustrating diversity. So now I will turn it over to Florence to welcome our guest presenter. I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joel. As president of our local league, uh, you wear a, a big hat, don't you? <laughs> so we are very, very pleased to have Antonio Franklin with us today. Um, and the topic is one that I've gotten pretty sick of myself, and that's the 2020 census. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a chore, I have to say that. And I really appreciated Judy, Judy's uh, participation with me in that on so many places, in so many ways. So thank you very much, Judy. And now she's moving. So are you at in Park Rapids right now or are you gone, Judy? You're in Park Rapids? But at any rate, I'm glad I'm to in, that you're here. Yeah, I'm in Park oh. Rapids. I'm moving my things May 1st. Okay, but very I'll still good. I'll be around. We, we live in a very, very mobile area, and oftentimes people are moving back here as, uh, it, or, or here in, as elders. And so um, we, we, we have a lot, lot of turnover over time. But I really appreciate the fact that Antonio is, is here, and he um, actually worked on, on the uh, census um, previously. He'll talk more about that later. Um, he is currently the Economic Development Planner for the Headwaters Regional Development Commission, the HRDC out of Bemidji. Um, he, he, uh, he, will, uh, he will be doing an update of the 2020 census um, and what came out of it. And uh, we'll be speaking about the redistricting process and the timelines that are, are required there. They'll also share the steps to um, encourage more people, what we can do to encourage more people, uh, or to, to I, I'm sorry, to encourage a more transparent process. That transparent process for Hubbard County would be the county board. Is that correct, Antonio? Yes, that is correct. Okay, well, take it away and thank you so much for being All with right. us. Uh, thanks, Florence, for the introduction and Joel. Uh, I appreciate you. Um, I appreciate Joel, Florence, and Caroline for inviting me today to be a part of this. Uh, it's such an important topic, and uh, um, it's a, it aligns a lot with the work that we do um, as a regional development commission. So uh, just give you guys a little background on what our organization does. Uh, so we are an economic development district, uh, and we are funded in part by the uh, Economic Development Association of the United States. Uh, we provide technical assistance, uh, planning, 
and administrative duties to our five county region. And uh, again, I just wanna thank you guys for joining us today. And uh, we have quite a few people here and I appreciate that. Um, I know uh, we also might have members on the call tonight that are probably part of the Complete the Count Committee. Um, I was a member of the uh, uh, Pennington County uh, Complete the Count Committee. Uh, so I appreciate your efforts you guys put in. Um, it's, it's very important work that you're doing. Uh, and, and today I want to present uh, not just on the 2020 census, but what does that look like locally and the redistricting process. And then I'll end this with uh, some steps that you guys can take uh, locally in your community to take action. Uh, so just going through an overview here, um, I will give an update on the timeline of the census, uh, talk a little bit about what that data release looks like, uh, participation at local and state level. Um, I feel like at local level, you can do quite a bit. So I really wanna share some of that information. And what is the impact? Uh, what does the impact look uh, uh, with the 2020 census in our state? Uh, and how is that going to impact funding level? Um, and then I'll go into redistricting. What does redistricting look like um, at both state and uh, uh, local level? Uh, and why does it matter? And then I'll, I'll end this with some steps that the community can take and end with some resources. And if anybody has any questions, go ahead and feel free to drop those into the uh, comment box and I'll reserve uh, 15 to 10 to 15 minutes towards the end so we can uh, answer questions and have a, a, a more in-depth conversation. Um, so here, uh, this is a, the census data release dates. Um, currently, uh, the uh, final census apportionment counts are not set to be released until later this month. Um, you can see that highlighted there in red. Um, you, you'll notice that throughout the year, all the way through the summer, they're gonna be releasing more data. Um, in, uh, the data is gonna be used in terms of, uh, so the first thing is the, fi uh, the final census apportionment counts. These, will, these are gonna be used at local level, state level uh, for um, elected officials and for the redistricting process. So that's why I highlighted that there. Um, also included is information released about annual population and housing unit estimates. Uh, these are going to be released on a flowing basis, as I mentioned, throughout the year. Um, and I encourage you all in this call to, to just stay connected and, and updated on when this information is released, because I'm, I'm eager, eagerly awaiting this information because we're using it. Uh, we'll be using it for our uh, economic development strategy for our region here as we update that. Um, so if you look at that link there, that you can get updates from the U.S. Census website. Okay, there's uh, two types of census data that they release. Um, the uh, first is the uh, population counts. So they'll start releasing summaries uh, periodically over several years after the census is conducted. Uh, and then you have geographic data, and this includes census blocks. Uh, this is the, the information that is going to be uh, provided to our state and, and, and counties and cities when they do the redistricting process. Uh, in, this census, in these census blocks, it also includes uh, geographical things such as roads, uh, railroads, rivers, lakes, and other geographical features in the United States. Uh, and, and the last uh, geographical data is census tracts. Uh, and these census tracts are uh, census blocks with between 1,500 to 8,000 people. And on this next slide here, I'm going to show you guys what, how this information is used on a local level. Uh, so during the Trump administration, they uh, designated opportunity zones, and these serve as low income. Um, these are low income census tracts that are nominated by our governor uh, and certified by the U.S. Department of Treasury uh, for to encourage investors to uh, invest in these communities. Uh, because they are low income, it just encourages that investment. And in return, uh, they, they get a, a, a tax incentive. Uh, so we have 128 of these, as you can see here on the right side of this slide. And there is one designated opportunity zone. I just wanted to highlight that there, because this is the kind of stuff we as economic developers look at and use 
uh, uh, this is a, a this is a program that would be beneficial for us that we would look at when we're looking at growing our our community. So there is one in Park Rapids and uh, Hubbard County, and that's located in the city of Park Rapids. And here's the information you guys are excited to to see, you know, as I showed on the first slide, the information is still slowly being released. But as you can see here, um, the self response rate and keep in mind, this only includes those that responded on their own and not by the work of those going door to door uh, and the people who collected those responses. So uh, you'll see here that the uh, self response rate as of January 28th, 2021 in the county was at 49.1%. And this includes those that responded by phone, mail, or internet. Uh, and then of that number, 40.1% responded through the internet. So uh, that's, that's kind of a, a high number, given the fact that uh, people were, we were going through a pandemic and had uh, limited access. Uh, so the remaining households were counted by, uh, like I mentioned, uh, census enumerators going door to door. And these are not included in that rate, but the uh, the uh, total census response rate numbers will be released at the end of the month, April 30th, when they uh, release those apportionment counts to the state and county. Um, I, I spoke with the uh, our regional census rep in Chicago, and uh, I was able to receive that information from her. Um, so. Keep an eye on that. Uh, follow the census website, sign up for their updates so you can get that information as soon as it becomes available. Um, if you look back at 2010, if we compare from the last decentennial census, um, we were at 50.3%. And keep in mind, this number is a, a complete total number and we're still waiting for data to come in. So our 49.1% is likely going to change. And that is with your guys' support that you guys did um, I, I expect that number to be higher. So that is good news. And let's just hope uh, when that information comes available, uh, we have some good information to share with our community. Um, another uh, important thing and something that we can be proud of as a state, uh, Minnesota received the highest self-response rate in the United States. Uh, so we we're at 75.1%. That is uh, something really proud to be, uh, something to be proud of. And these again include, uh, you know, phone, mail, or internet. Um, if you look at the national rate, uh, it was a 67% self response rate of households that responded online, phone, or by mail. So that is good news, and I hope that number trickles down to our county and we have a high number as well. So what is the impact of uh, the census data? What are, what are we looking at for our state? Uh, and this is by no surprise because uh, in our last census, we were at risk. We barely uh, maintained our congressional seat during the last apportionment announcement. Uh, so in this 2020 census, uh, our state is at risk of losing a uh, congressional seat. Uh, we've maintained at least eight, or we, we did maintain eight congressional districts for the last 50 years. Um, so what would this look like if we lose a seat? So districts will expand by size. Um, so districts will take on, uh, on average, 100 more people to make up for that loss because so you can look at it this way. So our, our, our United States population is in the 330 million uh, estimated amount. So when you take our total number of US House representatives, each, each uh, House district should have roughly around 700,000 people. Um, so, that set that, so that is how that would be distributed there. Hopefully that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you take that 400, our total house reps into the total US population, and that kind of gives you an idea how much is in each district on average. So here's a, a map of the United States. Uh, this shows um, which states are going to either gain or lose a seat. 
you can see, uh, like I mentioned, we are at risk of losing a seat. And um, we already have, uh, if you look at the, uh, I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. If you look at uh, District 7, which formerly was Colin Peterson, uh, representing that district, it's that's grown in size too because of the, the the population counts that you know it's very rural, and there's not a lot. It's not as dense as the uh, uh, the cities are, so they're going to grow a little bit out. That is what I was reading in uh, in some uh, news news articles that um, they're thinking that it might be those uh, that have that are in the city districts gaining more rural uh, voters. Okay, so what is redistricting? Um, this is the act of redrawing boundaries for representational districts. Uh, I also want you to see the difference because it's really easy to get redistricting and reappointment confused. So the reappointment is the process of assigning seats in a legislative body among pre-existing political subdivisions such as states and counties. Um, so what's the purpose of redistricting? It's to ensure that each people of each district are equally represented. And this aligns with the uh, League of Women Voters. Uh, you guys, uh, you know, one of your goals and objectives is, is the uh, equality and inclusion and, uh, you know, um, rep making sure that there is transparency and accuracy in the mapping is, is very important. Um, and on to the next slide here. So I showed you prior the uh, census timeline. This is the redistricting timeline. It's a little, it looks a little different because it goes through the process that uh, state and local officials will go through. Um, and I highlighted, uh, you'll see in blue, some important dates uh, for local officials to keep an eye on. Uh, and uh, so on the, on the March 21st, there's going to be these uh, redistricting data files are gonna be released to all states. And then, like I mentioned, the, uh, the counts are gonna be released later this month. Uh, so we have that data already. It just needs to be released uh, you know, at, at county and local level. Uh, the, the deadline for reestablishing or redistricting of municipal uh, precincts is going to be uh, of next year. So we, um, our, our counties, our local uh, elected officials, they have until next year um, to, to reestablish uh, their redistricting plans. Um, and then on uh, April 26th, the deadline for adoption of these new local elected uh, the uh, new local government election districts, uh, they need to be adopted by April 26th. And like I mentioned, if anybody has any questions, drop those into the uh, chat box and we'll, uh, we'll I'll answer them at the end. And uh, um, I, I appreciate questions, anything that you have, I'll be happy to answer. So, uh, so redistricting in Minnesota, um, who is responsible uh, for that process? It is our state legislator. Um, and every state in, the, in our country determines their, their own process. Um, the state, the, the, the federal government does have some, uh, some, some uh, statutory requirements for you know, our, our, uh, our, our US House and Senate uh, rep, uh, representatives. So, but at local level, they can determine that own process themselves. So. Uh, and then the other thing that our state has is uh, the, uh, district lines are subjected to veto by governors. Uh, so Governor Waltz can veto uh, whatever uh, redistricting plan is uh, brought before him. Uh, and, and very oftentimes the uh, redistricting of our, of our state usually does end up in, in, in the courts. And that's just a usual process uh, in terms of just wanting that accuracy and, and um, Transparency. I see a question coming in. You know, so what are the requirements? What you're looking at here are are the uh, uh, federal requirements and and some uh, uh, some state statutory requirements. So um, every state needs to have uh, equal population in their districts. 
uh, single member Senate districts is a must and housing districts need to be nested within the state districts. Um, and then in terms of for Minnesota, our statutory requirements, uh, a redistricting plan must cover the entire territory of the state. So we can't leave any piece or any uh, section open. Uh, there needs to be uh, redistricting new lines drawn for the whole state. Mm -hmm. uh, all districts must be equal in population. Again, that's the same as the federal. And we must not sub subdivide political divisions more than necessary. Political subdivisions are cities, towns, uh, you know, villages, uh, things like that, so. So I want to show you the uh, district maps. Oops. Hold on here. Looks like we jumped ahead a couple. Uh, here are the district maps. So we are in uh, Legislative District 2A. And I want to show you this because it's important to know uh, who our representatives are uh, at state, so who our house, our state house representative is, and who our Senate state representative is, um, you know, and then we have our county commissioners. Uh, it's important to know who they are because they are the uh, bodies that work with the redistricting in our communities. And then if you go to a micro level, you have your city council members and and your mayor. So it's important to know at, at your city level what structure your city has because not every, um, most of our cities have the same type of structure, but there are, are uh, um, structures that have what is called a weak mayor. So the mayor may not have as much power and may allocate duties and administrative duties to the, the council. So just understanding who's in power and who, who does what's important. Uh, so you can see here, uh, my cursor there, there's Hubbard County, and then here's a larger map of, of of the county, and then you can see the townships. Uh, See, so we have five. We have five districts. Um, a county can have up to nine districts, and uh, counties in the cities can have. Um, there's specific counties in the in, a, in uh, the metro area that can have more, uh, due to their size. So know who represents you and then know who our federal legislators are. But I always say this on a, on a local level, you're able to make a stronger impact and connect with them a little better than you are our, our, our federal uh, representatives, you know. So local redistricting requirements. Um, now that we've covered uh, what the state requirements are, uh, we can see what they are on uh, locally. So here are the county requirements. The county board is the is the body that is responsible for uh, redistricting uh, commissioner districts and for any precinct located within the territory of the county. Uh, they have to complete their redistricting plan 80 days after the state legislator com uh, completes theirs. Um, and for the city uh, and towns, uh, they are required to uh, establish their existing precinct boundaries or redraw them to conform to uh, statutory requirements as well. Um, so they have 60 days uh, to complete their uh, to complete theirs after the state legislator. Um, also, I want to mention that the uh, so first class cities populations with more than 10,000 people uh, and with what's that. I'm sorry, I should mute here. That's okay. Uh, we don't have any uh, 10,000 member uh, cities. Right. Um, well, the other thing I wanna mention is school districts. Um, so for school districts, uh, they need to keep an eye on what the redistricting looks like in their city. Um, if a school board member is elected at large, uh, the school district does not have to have any special elections uh, to redistrict, uh, but the school district needs to assess how the precinct boundaries change, changes affect polling places combined in a, in a school uh, district election. So when these uh, wards change in the cities and understanding what, what's going on is very important for that school district. So the school board has, has a big role uh, during this time. 
Uh, and I wanted to go into the county uh, redistricting process because there's a, there's a, they take on a, um, a, a lot of responsibility, a lot more, I would say, than, than the city does. Uh, um, so uh, counties can also levy uh, a special redistricting tax to cover related expenses, not to exceed $1 per a person uh, within a levy year, and they can use these to pay for the cost um, uh, that are associated with that. Um, District populations cannot vary more than 10% from the average of all five of our uh, Hubbard County uh, districts, unless the results force the voting uh, precinct to be split. So why does this all matter? Why do we need to know redistricting and, and um, as, as a citizen, why is it important? Well, uh, it affects political power um, it, it, it can determine, you know, uh, uh, how many de Democrats or Republicans may be in one district. Uh, it may split up uh, uh, communities based on uh, 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 minority or diverse communities. So one thing I would suggest is don't let the elected officials choose their voters. I mean, you vote for an elected official, so don't let them get a chance to choose who they want to vote for it should be the other way around. Uh, so this is why it matters that um, our, our county and city uh, invite the public to be part of that process. And uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit about that later and things that we, we can do uh, as, as uh, citizens of a county to, uh, to help with this process. Uh, it also determines who you vote for. So, you know, if, uh, if, if, if we don't keep an eye on the redistricting, then it, it just gives them a free range to decide, okay, we're gonna decide what the uh, city and what the county is gonna look like and we can determine what the votes are. So just having public eye on what's going on is important. And again, um, you know, it, it affects, uh, you know, it can affect people of color. It can affect, uh, you know, depending on districts that they live in, they can split these up. And, you know, it, it has happened in the past years. So now we're going into the ugly side of uh, redistricting. And this, this term is probably, um, I would say most people probably have heard this term before. Uh, in terms of politics. Uh, so the term is gerrymandering. And uh, this is the, excuse me, the manipulation of district lines to protect or change political power. And you can see the guy on the right. Uh, this is uh, Governor Jerry Elbridge, and uh, uh, who was later Vice President of the United States, but he served as the uh, um, Governor of Massachusetts. And uh, the word was created in reaction to a redrawing of, uh, of their state Senate election districts. And you can see here the map resembled the shape of a salamander. So that's where you got his first name and um, the salamander. So um, it's a very popular uh, uh, process that, that a lot of people and uh, historians have talked about, and it's used to reference what we shouldn't do in terms of redistricting. So there's two things under gerrymandering that could happen. Uh, packing uh, is, is putting most of the uh, voters uh, in the opposing side into a smaller number of districts. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like to make sense of that. And then you have cracking, and this is splitting the voters of the opposing side into several districts that are minority. So splitting the voters of the opposing side into several districts where they are the minority. So here's a good uh, diagram that gives you an understanding. So on the left, there's 50 people. Let's say, uh, you know, so we got 60% and then 40% there you can just decide on who they are as a, as a political party. So you, you can do that in your mind. If you look here, here is a perfect, number one shows a perfect, perfect representation uh, where they're, they're not overly uh, 
um, overly giving credit to one side or the other. You know, it's a very, it's balanced here, as balanced as that can be, given the 60-40 the split that they have. Um, this is what you don't want to do. So this is, they're, they're, they're basically setting these lines so the blue has majority in every single district. Every single district there has where the blue has majority. So there's no way, if, if an election was held, no way that a, uh, a red, let's say, uh, commissioner would win that district. Uh, if you look at three, this is another example of what you don't wanna do. And uh, you can see how they, they redrew this to, to give a representation to the red. And this probably could be a good example of maybe there was uh, sections in here of, commu of uh, let's say uh, townships that may have minority communities and they can draw these lines in a specific way that keep them or um, limit their representation. So you can think of it that way, you know, maybe, maybe the, uh, the blue was, was uh, these, the underrepresented that they were trying to uh, uh, limit their power. So what can a community do? This is important part. And um, some of this aligns also with what the uh, League of Women Voters represents as an organization um, and not just them, but what communities should be doing as well. So uh, one of the important things that you could be doing is advocating. Um, and so this could be supporting an independent redistricting commission. So creating something that's separate from uh, the commissioners, right? Having a independent redistricting commission or um, a different body of people that are observing that process. So you don't have the elected officials um, drawing those lines who are elected officials. So that's something that we could support and implement uh, in Hubbard County. Uh, participate in public hearings uh, to ensure transparency and accuracy. And this is actually recommended for our uh, county and city to do. Um, it's, it's in the, uh, the uh, redistricting guide that's provided by the Secretary of State. So they're re not required, they're recommended, but they, we should be making sure that they, they have these hearings in, our, in the community so we can be a part of it. Uh, civic engagement and education, what we're doing right now, you know, knowledge is power, the more that you know, I, I think it, it, it just gives you a, a better understanding of how to change what's wrong with the uh, uh, political system. So meet, meet, and, uh, meet with and educate elected officials about the community you serve. Um, and I think doing these in groups like this and making sure that they, they show up and be part of the conversation is important. Uh, and connect with others in the community uh, to continue to promote transparency and uh, accountability. So whether that's your, 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 your nonprofits or maybe some of your media outlets like uh, um, our, our newspaper and the radio, you know, get in places like that to share uh, public perspective on the process. Um, and again, uh, it's like I said, just encourage local officials to solicit public involvement, um, encourage them to, to have this process. So, um, and it, I really think that having an independent redistricting commission limits a lot of the, uh, uh, the risk. And, and of course it's still gonna require transparency, but it does, it does limit that, that political, um, that, you know, as an elected official, it limits that political, uh, uh, issues that can come up with them wanting to pick their voters, basically. So uh, one thing that the uh, League of Women Voters has that uh, I encourage people to go look at, and this is um, on their website, is the, uh, it's called 
power, uh, people powered fair maps. And it's, it's really all about um, ensuring that maps are done fairly, that there's transparency and there's accuracy in the process. And you can, you can see what their goals are um, to make sure that that happens. So you can find that, I'll have that in the resource section. Um, and then here are some, some resources here and I'm gonna actually go back out to my screen. I have these up so you can see where they're at. And I'm gonna hopefully, uh, let's see here. I have to share my screen. So if you can just be patient with me. Okay, here we go. So here's the first resource that I want to share with you. So this was this is the uh, powered people fair maps. And if you're not sure if you're not sure about what you can uh, support or what you can do, this gives you kind of a, an outline of of uh, several different ways that you can um, that you can help. Uh, so there's there's some focus areas that you can take back into uh, Park Rapids and Hubbard County. And here is the uh, uh, Secretary of State. Uh, they they play a big part in the election process, the district mapping, and um, they also have the guide. Uh, the redistricting guide is also placed here on their website. So. Um, if you're looking for more in-depth information, you can go on their website to learn the whole process. It's probably gonna be dry information, but if you're ever looking to go to a direct section to find what, what you're looking for, that's a good guide. Uh, and then the last one here is, uh, I found this really nice guide for uh, communities and it's more of a broader, for, uh, written for more for all communities, um, but it, it has a lot that that is uh, applicable to a local community like Hubbard County. So um, I'll share these guys these resources with you. And if you guys want, I can share whoever's on this call. Um, if you put your email into the uh, comment section, I'll I'll send you this PowerPoint so you have it for your reference. And that is, uh, that is it, I'll pull back, I'll go back to the presentation here. And again, I just wanna thank you all for uh, uh, being on this call today and inviting me to be part of this. And I, I hope you learned something here. I'm not a politician. I, I have knowledge of these, uh, this process. And, and you know, as many of us, we use this information and in the work that we do, I need the data so I can prepare for a comp our comprehensive economic development strategy. So I'm, I'm waiting for this data. You guys are waiting for it. And I'm really, really hoping that the, the work that you guys put in, I know it's gonna pay off and uh, I hope that number increases this year. So thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for taking time to be with us today. Um, I, I'm, I really would like to encourage people if they have questions, um, I was interested that the Peter people powered maps. Whoops! Now I've lost the camera. This I'm is sorry. amazing. I'll go back to that there. Okay. I don't know that you can help me. It's something's okay. Well, okay. <laughs> the oh dear. Uh, I'm sorry. I I really don't know what's on the on the frame right now. But um, I really oh thank you. Uh, we did have that presentation, but. Um, it is, it's, it's a really good refresher. It's a good time for us to know that now is when this information is really critical in terms of uh, um, helping our, our, or at least keeping track of our local officials. We have, I believe, an, a unique experience um, for Hubbard County that none of the county commissioners that we have currently have, uh, were commissioners during a time when redistricting was happening. Mm -hmm. So. Um, they're making decisions and it really is a, a particularly important time, I think, for us to be aware that the commissioners are also, um, uh, I'm sure that they get training, uh, but that we need to keep an eye on what's happening and uh, just let them know that we care. We care about our maps and what, where people 
how people are represented in the county. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a very great point, Florence. Um, you know, with with having new commissioners, uh, I would still encourage you guys to get them on a panel uh, and, and invite community members there, so you can answer them, answer, get the questions answered that you have, um, and they need to be connected to the community uh, if they want to get elected again, but not just uh, to get elected again, but to uh, you know make sure that they're they're doing the right work. So okay. any other questions? I'm gonna pull the PowerPoint back up. So if there's any sections that people have questions about, I can go ahead and uh, easily Antonio, go back. Yes. Antonio, can you see the questions that were in the chat or do you want some someone to read those? If somebody can read them, that would be great. Uh, but I am, okay, here we go. I think there's a date error. Okay, yep, there was a date error there. Um, all districts must be, that is correct. Uh, contentious to the US. Yep, and should be compact as such. Uh, I gotta make my screen a little bigger. Here we go. Yep, you are correct. Yep, that is, that is a requirement of the districts, yep. I don't think we know what you're speaking to right now, Antonio. We can't see. I don't believe what you're looking at. Yeah. Okay. All districts must be contiguous to and should be compact as possible through the seventh and eighth. Uh, though the seventh, though the seventh and eighth are not compact, and should be similar in economic demographics too. That is correct. Yep. So there are some uh, non-statutory uh, 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 policies that people uh, included, and those can include uh, economic development demographics. And if, give me one second here. So those would be things like uh, making sure that the uh, like equal representation of people based on color of skin, women, men, uh, you know, things like uh, um, partisanship. So those are the kind of demographical things that they don't want you to include in there. But so don't they, they do want you to kind of include like this same predominant industries, correct? Those kinds of things. That so is like correct. if you have a mining district, you don't want to mix out with an urban, you know, a rural district with an urban. Right. Yep, that is correct. So then the next question here, um, and I don't think that is a, a question, but um, Florence just mentioned Hubbard County is divided uh, 2A and 2B with a smaller amount in another district. Okay. And Caroline asked if there's any pre-release data um, that I've seen uh, that are, are major changes reflected in the in the count for Hubbard County. So when I talked to the uh, um, the our regional uh, U.S. Census rep, the if you're speaking to the the data like uh, the uh, um, self response rate, that is what we have at the moment. Um, they do release some estimated information prior that they use some kind of formula, it's, they use estimates. So uh, vintage uh, estimates is what they use. And these are, um, they have a certain formula that they use to at least release that data the prior year and during the time of the census. Um, so there is, is some information out there right now, but again, these are estimates. Okay. And if you're curious, there is a, so on the, um, the U.S. Census website, that information is on there. Um, I can get you, I can send you that information directly. So you can keep an eye out on, on what that information looks like and how to use it. Um, Florence also, uh, let's see here. So we had an event on this issue a couple of years ago. Florence, you had an issue on it. Is that the event that you were telling me about? The, uh, uh, the event, yeah, the event that we had um, was actually um, people-powered people maps, 
Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is just a really, I think, a, a good reminder of, of how important it is that we um, keep in mind that um, citizens have a responsibility <laughs> to make sure that representation is appropriate for their area. Yeah, I believe I did an event on this too, because we had uh, one of the county commissioners, Char Christensen, was there mm -hmm. when I did an event one evening. Yeah, yeah, it has um, it, it has a huge impact. I mean, the census is one thing, right? The census, uh, obviously, we 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 on it, at, we receive an estimated eight billion uh, annually from from uh, in funds to our state, and then as, uh, per person, it's um, uh, one thousand five hundred per person. So that's fifteen thousand over the the course of ten years. So I mean, all this money that could flow into our state and our county is important, but the redistricting process is just as important. Um, you know, I, I just saw yesterday on the news uh, that the, uh, here, here in Beltrami that they cut teachers funding. Uh, so they're cutting out teachers uh, for this, this coming school year. So, you know, a lot of these, this, everything from the funding that we receive at, uh, in our schools to, uh, our, our, our health care, which is a huge one, whatever whatever thing that is important to you. I mean, every person does count. So, um, Elizabeth, I'll share the uh, PowerPoint with everybody. Um, and I'll, if I can just get a list uh, of, of emails, I'll send that to everybody so you have it. And then, uh, Caroline, I'll send you the uh, information from this uh, census there on the pre-data that they release. Yeah, I'm going, um, Antonio, I'm going to put this information together with the recording on our website. And okay. so I'll put those resources live and put your PowerPoint up there separately as a PDF or a PDF. Okay. So that, uh, that way people can get it that way too. Perfect. I'm trying to think of any other um, any other thing I want to share with you guys? Um, if anybody has any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And like I guess, like uh, Florence mentioned, if everybody can just come together, hold more things like this educate, uh, invite your local officials, all that will be important to uh, uh, help with these kind of processes and uh, um, it will go a long way, so. You know, one, one thing I would suggest too, if you have any local community organizations, get them involved, you know, get them involved. If, if this kind of aligns with their mission and what they do, get them involved, let them help you. Um, I know you guys have Heartland Lakes Development Commission. Um, there's there's uh, plenty of, uh, um, you have that beautiful armory there. Uh, uh, there's lots, and hopefully they open that up soon. I think that would be a good place for you guys to uh, um, have a, a public forum, you know. Uh, Julie, Julie put a question in here. Uh, are county commissioners aware how tr transparent they are to be required? Um, so they, so yes, the public inform uh, they are to provide that information to the public so that, that there can be any, uh, if anything needs to be changed or anybody has any other suggestions, they're supposed to take those into account. Um, voters have rights too. Voters can. Uh, can actually, um, if something doesn't look right, a voter can actually say that and it can be held uh, in, in court. So um, the, the correct term of that, uh, let's see here. But just know your rights too as voters. So you, you can actually, uh, if something doesn't look right, say so, and that can actually um, stop the process so it doesn't become law. And, 
and that has to do with the boundaries uh, for the for the right. okay. Mm -hmm. I I I just ex speaking from experience from the 2010 election. Mm -hmm. uh, I I did sit in with the county commissioners just watching the process, and um, I I really do think that we need to keep our eyes open very very much because there's a lot of effort to keep the districts not changed. That the commissioners want to have the people they've been representing. At the, or wanted to have the people that have been in their districts before. They didn't want to bring in new people or lose old people. Okay. And um, so it really did get to be a bit of gerrymandering, not too significant, but mm -hmm. I believe they gave themselves the, the leeway of 10%. Okay. So here, here's, here's, what, here's what it is. Any qualified voter may apply to the district court of the county for a writ of mandamus. So they can they can stop that, a writ of mandamus, so they can stop that uh, process. I'm not, I'm not a legal, I'm not an attorney, but I, there is a, just know that there is a process that you as a voter can do if, like Florence said, uh, she believes that there's gerrymandering going on or whatever it might be, uh, or something doesn't look right, you can stop that so they can have someone look at it. And that information is in the resource. So that is actually in here. Let's see here. It's in the Secretary of State. It's in their guide, this redistricting guide right here. You can find that in there. And it would be under, it would be under the county section. Any other questions? Thank you so much, uh, Antonio, for joining us today and for um, keeping us aware of what we as citizens are responsible for and uh, the opportunities that the League of Women Voters gives us to speak out on behalf of the people. Um, so I, I really appreciate the time you've given us and, um, and I, I, uh, I expect to stay as involved as I can, even though it was a really, really tough time for the census, especially when I learned what we actually had gotten compared to what we were, we were getting feedback all the time while the census was on and it kept moving up a little bit more than what you had. So um, I'm just hoping that, that it'll come out better when it actually is, but it's still, being having only 50% of the people in the county counted means to me a loss of 50% of the potential monies that would flow into the county based on the census. It doesn't make sense to me. Why wouldn't we work really hard to have a complete count? So thank you again. Yeah. And thanks to everybody for uh, participating in this. I hope that you found it to be a useful um, um, effort and CC, thanks a hundred times over for all you put into it. You're more than welcome. I'm stopping the recording now.